Praise team, so much, musicians, for what truly is a strong tie-in message to uh, our series, Free to Live Faith. Our chains are gone. You've been set free. My God, my Savior, you've ransomed me. Thank you for freeing me from the destiny that I deserve, and thank you. Thank you, Father, for freeing me from the punishment, the payment of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for being the redemption, the propitiation. We're going to go into Galatians 2 today and teach from there, but before you go there, you might want to open your Bibles to Acts 15 to follow along in my introduction here in a little bit. If you'd allow me to go there, go there with me. Now, Here's a little preview. I don't have the title up there yet. I usually put it a little bit later in there. But we're going to talk about messes today. And so we're going to read a little better background in Acts chapter number 15 like we did a couple weeks ago that give you some context and a historical end. You know how I like to walk it through a little bit of historical, a little bit of doctrinal, and then we'll make some inspirational or applicable things here at the end. But Acts 15 gives us, again, context of Peter and Paul, how they're working through something very, very important. In fact, it's like a mess. And you know this world has a lot of messes. In fact, each one of you here probably has a list of messes. You either are going through a mess, or you've been through one, or one's going to come around the corner, and usually messes are of our own making. But sometimes God will allow messes to show up on your doorstep and you had no say in the matter. Paul the Apostle had no say in the mess right here. We talked about it a little bit a couple weeks ago and how that we had a, a bit of legalism creeping into a little bit of, hey, we need to abide by the law after salvation, circumcision, and now we're going to look at eating of meats and how the Gentile and how they live their lives why are they doing that the way they're doing that? Wait a minute. Peter says, well, we should do that. After salvation, you should abstain with me from me. It's just like the Jewish Judaism sect and their religion. So that gives you a little bit of historical because, again, Peter has got a mess, and Peter has to deal with it. Just know this. You and I know that legalism can be a mess. Hypocrisy can be a mess. And in those messes, we have to learn how to deal with them. But in order to deal with them, first we have to learn how to deal with our own messes within ourselves. And so here we are in the context. Pick it up with me. Acts chapter number 15, verse number 22. A little background is the fact that Paul has already gone and headed over to Jerusalem to speak with Peter. And now they're back uh, there and they're going to uh, eventually go back, they're going back to Antioch and then Peter's going to show up and so I'm reading this through for you so you get a context of Galatians chapter number 2 when it says that Paul withstood Peter. He confronted them. It happens here around verse number 34, 35. It has to be in that place because of the setting here historically. Follow along verse number 22. A little bit of historical background. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Please understand that when two people are coming along with some others, and they're known. They just don't count on the testimony of the word, which is very, very important, Paul and Barnabas, and anyone that knows them, but they write out letters, letters of commendation, letters of recommendation, so that people know. It's like you go forward, and you're going to show up somewhere, and somebody says, who do you know? Well, let me send you my references. Let me send you a letter of reference. People would like to have a letter of reference. People ask me to do that a lot. And I'm very good at lying, so if you need anything, you just give me a call, send me an email, and I, no, I'm, just, I'm just joking. That, gosh, that's on video. What am I thinking? Father God, forgive me. I tell the truth. I tell the truth. But they're telling the truth about these guys because they're headed off, 
and they need letters of commendation and recommendation, don't forget, Paul, Barnabas, these guys are going to church planting. Of course, now we find out in the second missionary journey that Paul's going to go off with Silas, and now Barnabas is going to go with John Mark because they can't work out the contention they have between each other. But for here, this is Jerusalem, back to Antioch. Here's some apostles heading off there. These letters are very important. They say some neat things about them. Verse number 24, carrying on and continuing. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. <laughs> you know, some of us, some of the people that have come out of our church have really messed with doctrine. <laughs> Like he says in verse number 24, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great recommendation. What a great statement. These are the guys that are the very best. They've put their lives on the line for Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you love to have somebody write that about you in an advanced letter of reference when you go somewhere? I'll write that letter for you, Chad and Ray. I know that Blue Springs isn't very hazardous, but those that have hazarded their lives for Jesus Christ. Because, again, they're saying that there's some people that have come out of this work that have convoluted, twisted, contradicting doctrine but these are not these are the men that you want to go along with Paul and Barnabas of course it continues verse number 27 we have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by their mouth for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than necessary things that ye abstain from meats and off to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves ye shall be well Fare ye well. <laughs> so when they were dismissed, they went to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets among them also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. Now this will be the context and the setting because now you know that they're there. Peter's going to come over there and Peter's now up at Antioch hanging out and having meals. Getting together in fellowship. This says in verse number 35, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So that's a great statement about their testimony. They're discipling, they're teaching, they're still doing the work of the ministry back in Antioch before again they get sent out. Why read that? To tell you that the church has had some messes and family messes and brothers and sisters, we, we, we have messes. Families, you, you have messes. They've been around. But again, in the midst of the mess, there's the proper doctrine. There's the right theology. It's following the word of God to know what's there. So that's a little bit of a context. Go to Galatians chapter number 2 as I uh, make a couple of statements to you. Up on the screen. It says, messes at home... <clears throat> They take a great deal of effort to clean up. We walked out to the house out there in Topeka yesterday. There were toys everywhere. I stepped on a couple of them. I said, thank you, God. Oh, oh. So don't take off your shoes until the to toys are picked up. But here's the fun part. The mom and dad want to make sure and clean up everything, to clean up the little bit of mess. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. We've seen that kind of stuff. No problem with the mess. See, some of the messes are just on the floor. Some of the messes are dust and cleaning up, so those things are just, they're messes that involve the house. But something else happens in the home. There's messes with the residents. Now, not everybody gets along with his family like Steve Redding does. Steve gets along with everybody. I've known him for 20 plus years, and you know what? There's never any messes, right? Praise the Lord, I love that. But the fun part about it is, and the tough part at the same time, is that when you and I look at ourselves and see what kind of messes we create, oftentimes the mess comes and we don't take the responsibility to clean it up. And usually it's us. We look to find someone else 
that's to blame for the mess, but most of the time it's us ourselves and the part that we played in the mess. And it might be that it's a physical piece of leaving a mess, but it's usually an emotional, spiritual, mental, emotional mess that we've created a little bit. So here's the second piece about where we're headed with this, because messes have to be cleaned up. Messes at church, they take a great deal of effort to clean up too. You have a mess in ministry, you have a mess of stuff. Uh, some messes just involve the building, while others involve the believers. We have a wonderful, incredible ministry, the cleaning crew ministry. Here's a little commercial for you, Barb. Here we go. Look, you want a place to fit at First Bible in a way that will really be completely fulfilling in the kingdom, in the body of Christ, in your local church. It's coming and being part of a volunteer crew cleaning the church building every week. And everybody said? Three, three people said amen. Barb said the loudest. Thank you. So, you clean up messes. It's okay. What if there was a mess from first service? Somebody got sick walking across and they vomited right here and we didn't pick it up. Would you smell it? Would you absolutely love it? Absolutely not. You'd be sick too. There you go. You see, sometimes we have messes and they come, but they're physical messes. Maybe sometime you go and talk, oh, the toilet stinks, the bathroom stinks. We'll clean it. Well, we'll leave it for somebody else to clean. So that's the physical part of the things because this building has 24, 25,000 square feet, but we clean it all the time. Some messes involve the building while others involve the believers. That's us. Sometimes we have messy things. Sometimes it's a well-meaning gesture that's taken wrong. But then other sides are somebody teaching false doctrine. Somebody teaching the wrong thing. Somebody teaching something against the Bible. Somebody going like these guys are going in a place where they're going to have to work out their contention. What if right now in the youth group, Josh Bennett's teaching false doctrine? Anybody have any teenagers over there? Would you be happy about that? Don't worry, before you get to them, I'll get to them first. I'll take them out. I'll send them to heaven. Praise the Lord. Just kidding. You had to deal with the mess. If Doc Clem is over there teaching some false doctrine, we've got to do it, clean it up right. But I'd never known him to and never know that he would ever do so. I know him personally. The point of the matter is, this morning, is that we have messes to clean up, and Paul the Apostle never invited this one, but now he has to deal with it. And he's dealing with it with the other prime minister of the church. They're the two prime ministers. Peter is the first. Peter is the leader of the early church. Now Paul has the same type of authority as he has. Wow. Now they're going to come together. As you're in Galatians chapter number two, hopefully you're all there, I would like you to join me. I'll have it up on the screen, but I'll also be reading it if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Let's read through this and see our text for today. And again, now we're going to look at, we have a historical background, a little bit of a doctrinal piece. We're only going to cover these six, seven verses this morning. Here we go. Verse number 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Of course he feared those that watched him now. Peter's been tossed back and forth. Those that are looking at him and saying, why did you eat with the Gentiles in Acts chapter number 11? And then on the other side of it, they're saying, okay, wait a minute, he clears that up and says, that's what God wants me to do. But then we have here... I'm fearful of what the circumcision is going to say. Those Jews that are circumcised that come as believers and they're saying, why are you allowing yourself to be around the Gentiles who you say are just like us in Christ? This is a real deal. This is a real problem. Verse 13. 
And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Have you forgotten that Barnabas got in on this? Who's Barnabas? Right-hand guy of Paul. Woo! Do you think Peter has a little bit of influence on people? Some of you have a lot more influence than other people. Peter, the apostle, has influence. Verse 14 says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. He didn't say walked uprightly according to how long their pants were, how their appearance was. He didn't say, well, they're not dotting their I's and crossing their T's and their dot. He said the truth of the gospel. This is where you're really going to go and stand up for the truth of the gospel. Because we know in chapter 1, first part of chapter number 2, Paul has made it clear the gospel cannot be perverted. The gospel cannot have anything added to it or it takes away from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the matter. This is where I'm seeing it. As Paul saying, they're not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So he says, what? Uh, let me defer. Let me capitulate. Let me, let, me, let me just backpedal. No, no, he says, I said unto Peter before them all, the witnesses that are around him, one-on-one. -on -one. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? How in the world can you say that you, being a Jew, converted into Jesus Christ, are now, as you have, stayed with and spent time with Gentiles that are born again, that are, or, have, or excuse me, you're reaching them for Christ, and now you've had a meal with them, and you've done all that, and now you're saying, no, 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 no. Gentiles that are like that, that are converted, no, you can't be with them. In fact, that's sin. How can you do that, Peter? You're now making a whole complete mess out of this Salvation and sanctification in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're messing with the justification of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's justification, the righteousness of God, you're messing with it, Peter. So verse number 15 and 16, keep in mind, we'll come back to this a little bit later when we just look at the doctrine and the application of this. Understand this is one whole sentence. Comma, 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 comma. Pay attention here now. It's very important. Remember now, he's an apostle. Paul, Peter, apostle. They are converted. He doesn't have to convince him how to get saved. Verse number 15. By who are Jews, excuse me, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. We being Jews need Jesus Christ. But we're not the sinners as same as Gentiles, but we still need Jesus Christ. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, God. That's how you're justified. Justification is a lawyer word. It's a big word in the courts. That means that in the court system, as you have had a, uh, an accusation, you are being charged by something, and they say, nope, you are innocent. You are pardoned. You are then justified. Justified in the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Comma, verse 16, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We'll come back to that in a little bit. He didn't repeat himself for the fun of it. In fact, he did not say the same thing. Just to reiterate, there's something very important in the context of that. So think of this real quick. Just, just take a pause in your, in your brain for about a minute. Here we go. When I say clean up the mess, when I say that there is something doctrinally that needs to be dealt with, who are you going to call? What are you going to do? You say, well, I don't know if that's going to affect me. What if someone teaches something contrary to the gospel? What if you meet somebody who says, hey, I remember that you were telling me that you were saved, born again, and you had Bible verses that told me that you had eternal securities. You know, one of the biggest wrestling matches in Christianity is once saved, always saved, or once saved, 
not saved could lose your salvation. It's a how are we going to clean up that mess? What if we're having two different contrad we have contradictions and two different teachings? How much different would it be than this? Nothing, because there's a mess here. And the mess is Peter being a legalist, being a hypocrite, and saying, hey, I'm going to hold you to a standard after your salvation. In fact, that sanctification, salvation, I'm going to hold you now in that sanctification in Jesus Christ, that justification, I'm going to hold you to a different standard. And now circumcision, we tried that. Gentiles and eating their kind of food, we're trying that. We're trying to find some way. This is a mess. Because the last thing that you and I need to hear is something contrary to the word of God about who you're supposed to follow and what you're supposed to follow. And there you implant the legalistic part of the church. I can't get you all to do what you're supposed to do for God or for me. I'm going to tell you what to do, and I'm going to bring up some laws and some rules for you to follow so that you can be more holy according to God, of course, but according to my ruling. That's what Peter's doing. To me, to the word of God, and when I look at this, this is a real mess. Go to Acts chapter number 11 with me real quick as a little bit of backdrop. And then I want to apply some principles here to you and show you some couple things. Acts chapter 11, verse number 17 and 18. Please remember this. Please remember this. When you see Acts 11, verses 17 and 18, you go, oh, this is Peter. Well, Peter's talking to the church. Peter's saying, hey, I had this visit from the Holy Spirit of God in my dream, and he told me to go see this Gentile. This Gentile is Cornelius. Cornelius was eating some food. He's of the Italian band. He loved barbecue. Oh, God. Okay, it's just before noon, so we're going to talk about barbecue for a few minutes. Cheesy potatoes. Oh. He went and did that, and he talked about it. He sat there and had a food with them. And it says how he gives this report, Peter, on the report on God's side, saying this is what happened. Verse 17, verse 16 we pick up. Then remembered I the word of, God, of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So these Gentiles who got saved, Cornelius' house received the same thing that the Jew that got saved received in the early church. No difference. Verse number 17 says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, so what was I? That I could withstand God. There's that statement again. I'm going to go withstand against God because God presented to me the doctrine and truth of what happens when you're circumcised by the Holy Spirit of God, that the Holy Spirit of God comes into you when you're born again, when you are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, the redemption that comes to you, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's no works involved before, after, in between. You called on the the name of the Lord to save you, bam. Guess what happened? You received the Holy Spirit of God. There you go. So he's saying, why would I withstand God? I will not go against what God's saying. Verse number 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace. What? The leaders of the church. And glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Go back to Galatians chapter number 2. Consider this. When you read Galatians number 2, you're getting an idea of something about a man named Peter who is solid as solid can be, who's on one side of the fence when it comes to the doctrine of what you should do after salvation, and now he's on the other side of the, of the doctrine of what you should do, that you need to have works to earn God's good favor in order for you to be sanctified, to be a good servant in the church. That's what he's telling everybody. So you get closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of you. You're going to set the universe on fire for the kingdom of God. You're just going to go, and you're just going to serve, and it's not going to be a choice of whether or not you did it or somebody else did it. You just do it because that's who Jesus is in you. That's what he does. But for Peter, it went back and forth and back and forth. So really... You see Paul and Peter's circumstances. There's Peter's circumstance. I just wanted to give it to you ahead of time. Peter's circumstance 
is in Acts chapter number 15 having this conversation. Remember what it says in Galatians chapter number 2 that, but when Peter was come to Antioch, duh, it happened in Acts 15, in that period of time, he's there, Paul confronts him. He withstands him. He speaks to him about how in the world is it now the same guy that has a background of dealing with this when he talked to the church of Jerusalem, <coughs> excuse me, not that long ago, and now you're coming to Antioch, you've had a meal with the Gentiles, you've hung out, you've had some, uh, some, some sausage and, and, and some, uh, uh, some shrimps and some lobster, all the dirty shellfish, oh, oh, oh it is so good. You've had all the pork and you've had all that stuff. How is it now that it's wrong? You see, Paul and Peter's circumstances, Paul can address it because he's a Jew too. And when you see Acts 11, you're reminded of what happened in Acts 10 when verses 9 through 18, Peter gave an accounting of going to the church. Excuse me, that was the accounting of the Acts of the Apostle. Then he, gives, uh, then he goes to the church in Acts 11 and tells them all that happened. See, Paul and Peter's confrontation which goes into the next thing I want you to see in verses 14 through 16, is that they had these circumstances, and Peter had developed a double standard in legalism, and it imposed a false morality. It was based on rules. It was applying to one group of people over here, another group of people over here, and I'm going to change it. And now the confrontation comes, and Paul's saying, hey, I'm a Jew too. But yet, in the Holy Spirit of God, in the liberty of Christ, and what we have in Jesus Christ, oh, Peter, what are you doing? You're creating dissimulation in verse number 13. You're, you're dissembling. That's the very definition of hypocrisy. You're not putting things together. You're dissembling them. You're not putting them together and assimilating them. You're dissimulating them. The legalist tries to simulate spirituality on the outside. But you know what Paul's saying to Peter in his confrontation? We Jews know the law, and we know the law can't save. We know that we need to get saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. So we do not please God by rules after our salvation. Guess what we do? We realize that there's no person on the face of the earth that can fulfill in the flesh what you're saying I can do because I have a dead carcass I'm carrying around that cannot and will not be pleasing to God because it is a dead, dead vessel. Yet Peter is saying, no, no, you need to do stuff in the flesh. No, it's the vehicle, the vessel by which the Holy Spirit of God moves you from the inside out, the heart of the king. Pastor Mike preached on that last week. It was powerful. Peter's not submitting to God. Peter's submission is <laughs> to himself. Just keep in mind this. God had to deal with the same thing in the church of Corinth when it came to Paul talking about them and how they did the Lord's Supper. They used to have, and this just it came from Acts chapter number 2, they used to get together, they'd have a meal, and then it would become, of course, the Lord's Supper. And they had a great celebration, the fellowship, house to house, have an incredible time. Now, let's stop the celebration of the way we were doing it, now it's the Lord's Supper. It's a different meal. It's now remembering the broken body of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross. It's remembering all that he did for us, and it's examining our hearts. Remember, he had to deal with that. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, because they were perverting the Lord's Supper. And they were turning it into a big meal, and they were not separating or doing what it is that's right by their actions and by their heart. Simple? Yes. Actually, it is. Because Peter and Paul's confrontation brought everything to the head. So, I think that, in fact, I know that. After looking at this historically and doctrinally, we need to take this and bring it home for the last few minutes like we do in our messages. So I want you to consider in what it takes to clean up the mess. The first thing you need to do, and understand that it has to happen this way, in order to clean up a mess, it'll require God's righteousness to be paramount in my own heart. You see, 
Think now. We've been looking at this in the study in the book of Galatians already about our own righteousness. Whose righteousness are you following? Is it God's righteousness through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit of God because this pure word is working in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure? Are you allowing that to happen? If not, then the liberty in Christ for you is a license instead of a beautiful place to do all that the Lord would have you to do from the inside out because God's righteousness is way up here to you. Not because you're going to prove that you're more righteous than anybody else on this earth, but rather I love doing righteousness because you made me righteous by your justification. You pardoned me. You made me brand new. I am now in a place where I can live righteously. The Bible says about itself, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's just a simple little extra application of rightly dividing or not rightly dividing the word of truth. In order to clean things up, you need to have God's righteousness as your paramount thinking, and that comes from the word of God. Check these couple verses out here. Romans 10.3, the context, of course, is that Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, but also believers just in general at Rome, and also unbelievers in Rome. It's quite a unique letter, and he's talking to a lot of different people. And here in chapter 9, 10, and 11, he's speaking to those Jews and how they need Jesus Christ as well, but also, too, that there is a remnant going to be later. There's other things that come into play, but in verse number 10, of course, we take out some verses in there, but we know that the context is Paul saying to you Jews, because I am one who's been saved and born again, you Jews, brethren, it says in verse number one, my heart's desire and prayer for God, excuse me, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Remember, Paul kind of messed up his, his mission work, but it's, I guess, it's okay in, his, in God's grace, but he was supposed to always go to the Gentiles. But he still stopped by to hang out, to speak to those Jews in every city that he went to just about. So this is verse number three up there on the screen. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Woo! And then you go down verse after verse after verse in that chapter, and you see so much. Of course, in the whole book of Romans, you see so many references to the righteousness of God. Paul was saying that the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness because they wanted to have their own righteousness earn their way into heaven. So here's Peter who's converted, born again, has the Holy Spirit of God, has led thousands to Jesus Christ, and yet goes back and starts hanging on, doing things righteous in his own flesh and passing it on to other believers. Another verse is found in Romans chapter number 14. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This verse says a powerful statement because the bottom line in all that we think is that, hey, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to do that and I get my meal and my drink and put this together and everything. Those are all okay. They're important, but it's not meat and drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What I was mentioning earlier about our granddaughter, that brings us an extra measure from God of his joy in the Holy Ghost that she is alive. That she, in the midst of all that, that's what we experience, the joy in the Holy Ghost. Not a fleeting moment. Also, too, the next verse that's up on the screen, Galatians 2.21. Some of you did not turn your pages, so you're still there. We're going to preach on this next week. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Wow. That hangs so much on itself. We'll get into that passage of Scripture next week. But think about the wonderful, incredible righteousness that's of God by his grace, justified by faith. Because if it wasn't, then Christ would be dead in vain. The second piece I want you to see here in making an application about cleaning up a mess is this. Clean up requires God's teaching on separation to be correct in my own heart. This is something very important. We need to come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. 
So that's when we just memorize one Bible verse. What's the context of 2 Corinthians in that place? It's talking about marriage. Be not unequally, unequally it's easy for you to say. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He's, the context is very, very simple. He's talking about marriage relationships and how he would have the church to be. And he's saying, hey, that's the part of what we say. Oh, that's just separate. Just, you know what? When you get saved, you just run to a cave and you don't talk to anybody. No! You are called to be a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. We don't get it sometimes. We think, okay, the proper legalistic teaching is for me to come out from among them and be separate and don't talk to anybody. <coughs> Paul's not saying that. We are to be separated in our lifestyle. We're supposed to be separate in our faith because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Simple example. I grow so close to the Lord. I have such a walk with the Lord I live in the liberty of Christ and the liberty in Christ. I, I live in the, in, in the fruit of the Spirit and the Word of God. And guess what happens? The people that are around me are going, when I go into the world to workplace, they're going, I don't want to be around you. Why not? Well, you're just too good. You're the goody, goody guy. You, all you do is talk about Jesus and talk about God. And you don't do anything wrong. You don't talk dirty. And they're the ones now that are separating from you. You see, that's really, see the doctrine and truth of separation. Look up on this verse up here on the, on the screen in John chapter number 17. Jesus prays this for his disciples. Okay, we've got 17, 17 and about the truth and, you know, sanctify thy word. As thou hast sent me, in verse 18, into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Jesus Christ was sent into the world by God the Father from heavenly portals. And he said, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth that Jesus Christ ever run from a skirmish or being around lost people. He went to lepers, blind people, the lost of the lost, the self-righteous, and everyone. He did not do that which we have translated in our teaching and understanding of separation, which is, excuse me, not biblically sound. They, the disciples he's playing for, praying for, they might be sanctified through thy truth. It says in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated unto. Well, now that I'm saved, I can't talk to my family anymore. Yes, you can. Well, you don't understand the problems and difficulties they have. We all have families. All of us have them. Well, I don't approve of some of the things they do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Allow your separation to be from how you live by faith. And then you'll have to make decisions according to the word and according to what the Holy Spirit of God gives you. And then it also says here up on the screen in Galatians, which you are near, chapter number one, Paul is saying, hey, Please, God, I was separated from my mother's womb. Hey, when you're born, God would love to have you be his servant from the very beginning. And that separation aspect is according to him, of course, saving you. You get saved, call on the name of the Lord, you get sanctified, and now the separation that happens in your life comes from you being more like Jesus Christ. A lot of people wanted to be like Jesus, and want, excuse me, be around Jesus, but a lot of people didn't. We need to have a handle on the truth of and God's teaching on separation. And lastly, as I tie this all together, the third thing about us cleaning up messes. To clean up a mess, to clean up, it requires God's justification in servanthood. And that you understand that in your own heart. You say, what do you mean? Well, that's what Galatians chapter number 2, verses 15 and 16 are saying. Watch this. Let me teach you a little something before you go on. You have used this verse, number 15 and 16, for salvation for a long time. That's good. But there's so much more here. I mentioned it in passing. Let's just see what it says. Again, Paul's talking to Peter a servant of servants, an apostle of apostles, 
He a preacher of preachers. He is the leader of the early movement of the church. He says, we, verse number 15, who are Jews by nature, are not sinners of the Gentiles, so let's just focus on, on who we are. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Great, period, sounds great, great salvation verse. But again, comma. You know what he's talking about now? The same way that you are saved is the same way that you serve. You're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ because of God's amazing grace and not by the works of the law. You don't just find a bunch of laws and go, okay, I need to do all these servanthood things. He's saying, look, let me just tell you what it says. It's so freeing. But guess what I can do? And by the works of the law shall no man be justified. Guess what? You do not have to do a bunch of list of things to be justified by God that you're being a good Christian. You ought to do them because they're an overflow of your heart because God is constantly filling you up to have the heart of the king. But that's your choice. And that's my choice. And boy, have I made a mess out of that a few times in my life. And so I figured, since the pastor told me to do something, I'll do it. And that's okay. That's an entry-level spot, but after a while, why would I even continue to do it that way? If the pastor said do something or, or a ministry leader asked me to do something, I'd probably go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe God's asking me. I need to go talk to the Lord about this. And then I need to get closer to the Lord so that I'm not like Peter is saying, ha, huh, I can't go to Mark's house and eat food over there because Mark's got incredible barbecue, but I am not going to eat your barbecue. I can't eat your barbecue. Why? Well, because I'm spiritually a Jew now. I can't do that. Oh, really? Well, that's going to mess with my walk with the Lord. Really? Where's that in the Bible? I can't find it. I just thought I'd make it up for myself. Here's a couple of verses to finish up. Two verses. Ephesians 5, they're beautiful. Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter number 2. Doc's going, I wonder if he grabbed that verse. I did. The investor's theme verse. So here you go. The statement here is this by Paul. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. And here it is. Walk in love. That's it. Walk in love. You say that's so easy. I know it is. On paper. It's like me saying, boy, huh, I could have been such a good pitcher. On paper. <laughs> I could just be so good in something in paper. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself. That's the sanctification that you have. You're justified by faith, by his grace. So now I'm just going to walk in his love and God's going to lead me everywhere I need to go to serve. And it's going to be so good. But we don't do it that way, so we then ask for somebody to tell us what to do. And after 10 years, we're stuck. Blaming the pastor. Because I have a workspace religion that you're belonging to. I don't want that. I don't want nothing to do with that in your life. I just want you to serve God out of your love and walking in love. So the other verse is Colossians chapter number 2. And you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. There's no other way to walk. The way you received him, that's the way you walk in him. The way you received him is the way you serve him. The way that you do life, is the same way you got saved. You say, you've said that an awful lot of times. I know. Because that's the whole crux of Galatians. For by grace are you saved through faith. Out of Ephesians, not of yourselves. The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You get saved for by grace. You can be serving the Lord the same way. The same way that Paul talked to Peter about. Stop bringing in the circumcision. Stop bringing in the Gentile food orders of the old Judaism way. Because right at the end of the whole thing is this. Our mess of legalism. The only way that we could clean that stuff up if we have it in our own lives. Just, I'm talking personal. I'm talking personal. I'm talking about churches and like that, but in general. But we have our own lives. Some of us old parents, man, we weep tears the way we raised our kids. 
a list of rules and a list of rules and a list of rules without relationship. And what does it cost? But I was so loving and such a good dad. Okay. God, forgive me. God, forgive me for not looking at the beautiful commands and rules and the love that God has for me and that I would choose just to do whatever he would want me to do because I'm living in his righteousness because of his justification. So I walk in his love. I guess I need to clean up my own mess before I could clean up any other messes. And that's what God is wanting us to do. It's very personal. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. As we conclude now, and we've had a sweet time in the word, and I just want to pray for you. As the music plays in the background, please respond as God would have you. And please, of course, do it according to what the Holy Spirit is doing, what the Word of God has done, what your Father in heaven would have you to do, not me. I thank you, Father, for this morning in your Word. I thank you for how your Word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you for the Spirit of God. I thank you for the reality that we have truly some messes in our own lives that we need to clean up. So I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, work in each one of the believers here and just have your way. This is your time. So I invite you, Father God, to work in your people. And in my prayer, I pray, it is totally and completely for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name.